everybody, how you doing? Welcome to another edition of The Drum Mission. All right, today we're gonna do something different, something I have never done uh, with this channel up to now. This is just gonna be me and you, me and you. So if you've been following my channel, you know that over the last month I've been uh, doing a deep dive on Bernard Purdy. We covered his use of ghost notes. We covered, of course, the most famous Purdy shuffle. Um, but I really could not do a deep dive on Bernard Purdy without mentioning the elephant in the room. Piano didn't mention it. So many people interview Purdy, they don't mention this because it's one of those touchy subjects. And Bernie would probably get mad if you confronted him about this in an interview. So you're saying, Glenn, what are you talking about, Glenn? What are you talking about? Maybe, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. It is the claim that Bernard Purdy replaced Ringo Starr on several of the Beatle recordings. So we're going to look at this claim and we're going to try to look at it. Since really nobody was there, right? Nobody, there's no videotape, there's no text messages or emails to look at. We're going to look at this in kind of the Occam's razor way. We're going to talk about the possibilities could this have happened or not have happened? What would it have taken to make this happen? And then, like Occam's razor says, and if you don't know Occam's razor, Occ Occam's razor says when presented, with two possibilities. One, that Bernard Purdy played on the Beatles music, or he didn't. The simplest answer is most likely the truth. That's Occam's razor, right? In doing so, I want to preface it. Any preface this, I can't speak ever. Um, anybody who has watched my channel knows what a fan I am of Bernard Purdy. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go out on the limb here and say I think he is the most influential drummer in all of pop recorded history. And I say that, let's make a case in point, let's just, although there were other things, ghost notes and feel and time, but let's just take the Purdy shuffle. He did it. He using ghost notes and his feel and how he presented the Purdy Shuffle and a Steely Dan tune, Home at Last, and he may have heard it from other drummers. He claims he just got it from Rhythms of the Railroad, the railroad tracks going by his house. Uh, whatever. He's the one that made it famous and he's the one that used it in Home at Last by Steely Dan on the Asia album. And then what do you hear? Jeff Picaro ends up using it on Rosanna. John, John Bonham uses it in Fool in the Rain. Steve Gadd comes out with a version of it. Vinnie Caliuta comes out with a version of it. Dennis Chambers comes out with a version of it. And, and heck, the, the Steve Gadd flutter lick, or, or more based on those techniques used in the Purdy Shuffle. So I'm not kidding when I say Bernard Purdy may have influenced, influenced rock and pop drumming more than any other drummer in recorded history. But everybody is yin and yang. He is great. There is no question that he is great. I am not questioning the fact that he is great. I am not questioning the fact that he played on more number one hits than any other recorded drummer. But there is this thing. It's the yin and yang of people. And here's, here's the thing about all people. All people have good and they have bad. And the line is wherever you want to put it, right? There are some people you hear they did something bad and then you want nothing to do with them. And there are other folks, eh, like for instance, you may work with a vocalist. And that vocalist or, or that songwriter may be late to every gig, every rehearsal, all that stuff. But they're great with the people, they're great entertainers, they're great writers, musical geniuses, you love working with them, working with them, but they're always late. So you learn to live with it. At the end of this video, I'm gonna give you my two cents of 
why I think it happened, and why Mr. Purdy might have said such a thing. Uh, I'm going to give you my two cents. And you, so you can already see where I fall on this issue. But for me, this problem does not take away from the greatness that Bernard Purdy is. All right, so you ready? Let's move on. Let's try to find the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's start with the claim right from Bernie's mouth. Now this clip is a little bit lengthy, but I'm gonna to try to keep this video under 20 minutes. It's about the magic number for people to watch it anyway. And I don't really wanna hear myself talk for more than 20 minutes. I don't wanna hear myself talk at all. Anyway, so let's start with the claim. And let's listen to it in its entirety. Now this claim has changed a little over the years, but this, this clip that I'm showing you is from his Red Bull interview, from Bernie's Red Bull interview, which really sparks the controversy in the biggest way. All right, so let's go to that clip. Let's watch this. Bear with it. It's pretty good. It's uh, Bernard Purdy with uh, some Red Bull guys. I don't know how the interview came to be, but it's on YouTube. You can look it up for yourself. It's a much longer interview, about 90 minutes. Here we go. 98% of the groups, self-contained groups, are not on their own albums. They are not on their own albums. And what I did and what I was doing was going in. I was one of the few drummers who could actually go in, join the group, and make the records. Because the record companies were paying a lot of money to make these records happen. My thing was, I got along with everybody, and I never went out and started hollering and complaining. No, that ain't so-and-so, so-and-so doing this, that, and the other. And I just did a job. The Beatles' music was just another job for me. Another job. Because half of the songs that I played, I played on 21 tracks of the Beatles. Half of them had no drums. Because they kicked them out in the beginning. And the whole point is that whether you realize it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, it becomes irrelevant at this point. But you're going to find out that he's not on anything. There are four drummers on the Beatles music. Ringo's not one of them. Wow. Wow. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of it, only because cause I want to keep this video at 20 minutes or, or less. All right? But I put in that whole clip so you can kind of hear it in context. And what he, what he starts talking about is very truthful for that error that at that time in that time period you had a lot of backing tracks being done by session players in some ways i mean uh there was that very famous movie on netflix called the wrecking crew wrecking crew is the name of these guys uh that played on so many records as a band backing up so many other artists and we didn't know that they were doing it i can't remember the names of those guys now but they're incredible and they played such on so, so many incredible tunes so we know that some of that stuff did happen and bernie's right as with everything when somebody's telling something and maybe they veer off the truth there is always truth in it there's always truth in it a look at the beach boys pet sounds brian wilson recorded that entire album without the band and they got mad People were listening to them thinking it was the Beach Boys, but it wasn't. It was Brian Wilson with a bunch of session guys. So here's where we kind of now go off the rails. And we're talking about credibility here. He says that statement, the very famous statement. There were, there were four drummers that played on the Beatles tunes, and Ringo was not one of them. That they kicked him out as a musician from day one, and they just had him as a figurehead or a picture. Okay, that seems unlikely. We have eyes. We all watched the Get Back series on Disney. We watched Ringo play with the Beatles. Ringo played for two years in the Cavern Club with the Beatles, seven days a week, six hours a day, 
when nobody knew who they were in 1957-58. They weren't just pulled out of the hat. Those times did happen. They fired Pete Best and they took Ringo. So we know Ringo played with the Beatles at that time. And let's say one more thing. One more thing. I'm going to post it here somewhere, just a, a picture of him playing. I Feel Fine, very famous Beatles tune, if you know that tune. Uh, the, the beat that, Beatles, that Ringo's playing in it is the What I'd Say Ray Charles beat. Paul mentioned several times that one of the things that impressed them about Ringo was that Ringo could play that beat. That's a very difficult beat pl to play. It's a kind of very, very fast up-tempo, like 160, 170 maybe beats per minute doing that Ray Charles What I'd Say beat. And you can see here, Ringo is playing that. And if Ringo could play that, there's a lot of other Beatles music that's much, much simpler than that. Certainly Ringo could do that. Now, corroborating evidence, corroborating testimony. There is none. George Martin, Giles Martin, uh, what's that guy's name? Mal Evans. He was like the big gopher for the Beatles. Uh, um, uh, Peter Ashton. And the list goes on. Engineers, secretaries, no one has ever come forward. And then if he's in Capitol Records, it's Capitol Records or Mercury or, and I'll get to Atlantic, a, the Atlantic is where we're going to center on later, Atlantic or ATCO, no one has come forward to back up that claim. George Martin was not shy about stating that he wasn't happy with Ringo's playing at first because Ringo, like many of the drummers of that time that were in bands, sped up and slowed down. He hires Andy White to play on Love Me Do and he was not shy about saying that. He's admitted that the drummer on Love Me Do and then he tried to get him to play on Please Please Me but the Beatles rejected it, uh, is a guy named Andy White, a session guy from England. So if you've got a session guy from England, so this is the point, a question I want to bring up, who lives down the road in London, who gets a ton of work from George Martin, and he already played on Love Me Do, which was selling the single of Love Me Do, and the album version of Love Me Do is Andy White. There's another single floating around with Ringo playing on it, but... Andy White is already on the, that material. Why not just use the guy right there? Mix him in right there. Rather than use a guy 3,000 miles away. Which is more likely. If I was going to do it, would I use Andy White? Or would I use the guy 3,000 miles away? Alright, so what really happened? What really happened? Alright, what I'm about to tell you is speculation based on Beatle fandom and myself and circumstantial evidence. Not the kind of Beatle fandom that thinks Paul is dead, but the more sensible, realistic kind. Okay, let's go back to Germany, the Cavern Club. At that time, in the beginning, Pete Best was the, Be the Beatles drummer, not Ringo Starr, Pete Best. Pete was not a very good drummer. So you're saying, well, why was he in the, in the Beatles, Glenn, if he wasn't very good? Maybe you're wrong. Let me let John Lennon tell you, in his own words, his own voice too, why Pete was in the band. By then we were pretty sick of Pete Best too, because he was a lousy drummer, you know. He never improved, you know. And uh, there was always this, this, this myth being built up over the years that he was great and Paul was jealous of him because he was pretty and all that crap, you know. And the reason he got in the group in the first place was because the only way we could get to Hamburg, we had to have a drummer. And we just heard that this guy was, we, we knew of this guy who was living at his mother's house who had a club in it, and he had a drum kit, and we just grabbed him, auditioned him, and he could keep one beat going for long enough, so we took him to Germany. And we were always going to dump him when we could find a decent drummer, you know. But by the time we'd got brought back from Germany, we trained him to keep a, you know, a stick going up and down a four in the bar. He couldn't do much else. You know? And he looked nice, and the girls liked him, so, you know, that was all right. Thanks, John. I don't know if that's right to say because of how he died. Okay, let's move on. Now, despite the fact that Pete Best wasn't very good, the Beatles, with their exuberance and their charm and their personality and their great vocals, became popular in Germany. Another popular guy at that time who became friends with the Beatles 
was Tony Sheridan, and he was friends with John and George and Paul and probably Pete too. Anyway, he, they were buddies. Tony Sheridan had a much bigger name at that time. Tony Sheridan decides to hire the Beatles for his album. Except because Tony had the bigger name, and the Beatles like to do this kind of thing, you know, Sgt. Peppers comes out of it, the Beatles use an alias kind of, and instead of calling themselves the Beatles, they call themselves the Beat Brothers. So the album, and I'm posting it here, says Tony Sheridan with the Beat Brothers. And you can look on YouTube and hear this, the engineer who recorded that album with Pete Best on it, says Pete's playing was so bad at the time that they had to remove his bass drum so there's no bass drum in the recording because Pete couldn't play his bass drum in time with himself. And all he had was a cymbal, a snare, and a hi-hat. That's it. Pete, I'm sorry if you watch this. These are the reports. He, he, he just wasn't very good at that time, at least. He was not very good. Fast forward, they fire Pete in under two years and they get Ringo. They get him out of Rory and the Gallagher's. Ringo had a name. He had a name. And it doesn't make sense to me that the Beatles would hire another bad drummer because Bernie gives that, that kind of idea that, Beatle, that Ringo wasn't very good. And it doesn't make sense that Paul and John would hire another bad drummer after getting rid of Pete Best. All right, let's fast forward some more. It's 1964, and the Beatles are blowing up. Everybody loves the Beatles. They're on the Ed Sullivan Show. America is going wild for the Beatles. And Tony Sheridan thinks, huh, I never released my album in America. Now that the Beatles are so big, maybe I should go and try to release it there. Remember, the original recording was done in the late 50s with Pete Best. So he's going to release it again, or try to, here in America. So he shops it around, everybody turns him down except for Atco Records and they say, great, we can release something with the Beatles on it. Yay, 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 yay. And here I'm posting it. Now the album says, Tony Sheridan featuring the Beatles and the word Beatles is all over the album cover where before it wasn't because nobody knew who the Beatles were. All right. But Mr. Atko, whoever this guy was, and by the way, let me make this a side note, Atko was owned by Atlantic. Hold it in your head, we're going to get to that. Atlantic Records, that is. Okay, so Mr. Atko listens to the masters and says, wow, the, the drumming is really bad on this. We can't really release this because right now things are about being danceable, and this isn't very danceable because the drumming is so bad on it. So, since Atco was owned by Atlantic, Bernie was touring and recording with Aretha Franklin, who was signed to Atlantic. It's at all possible, and this happened all the time, that they called Bernie and say, Hey, Bernie, would you mind coming in and doing your magic and re-recording over the drums on this? This is 1964. So Bernie in his head would think that he's playing over Ringo. Because Bernie would not know that there was a Pete Best. So he ends up re-recording over the entire album. It gets released here. Tony Sheridan with the Beatles. Paul, John, George, Pete pulled out, Bernie put in. And I have here a copy of Ain't She Sweet and Sweet Georgia Brown on, at, on Atlantic Records, okay? And you can tell when you hear it that those drums were not recorded in the same place. And they recorded with a much, much stronger drummer than Pete Best ever was, especially if you go back and listen to those anthologies and hear the original recordings with Pete Best. Okay, one last thing. So, Here's my little scenario of what might have happened. Remember, Bernie thought he was replacing Ringo because back then in 64 there was no Google or anything like that. He didn't know he was replacing Pete Best. So he says to somebody at a party, maybe a friend of his from a different record company, maybe another musician, says, you'll never believe what I did last week. What'd you do? 
I played an entire Beatles album. Evidently, they're not using that guy at all. No kidding. Yeah. He's just a picture. They're not using him. And there were rumors, by the way, that Pete Best was in the band because the girls liked his picture. There were rumors at that time of that. That guy that Bernie tells that to goes to somebody else and says, Hey, you never guess who I ran into last week. Who? Pretty Purdy. He said he just recorded a Beatles album. The whole thing. And the guy on that album, Ringo? Yeah. He's not playing any of the drums for the Beatles. No kidding. And then somebody else tells somebody and somebody else tells somebody. And there you have it. This rumor and this legend start. And then finally it gets back to Bernie in whatever new metamorphosized version it is and Bernie either he can't remember because he did so much work he doesn't know or he just wants to save face and they ask him about it did you record all the Beatles stuff and he goes yes me and a few other guys so I don't think it was malicious I don't think it was evil I think it was one of those things it was one of those things. And then when he finally realized what had happened, it was way too late to say, oh. Because then it just sounds like you were just talking, right? You were just talking. And it puts everything else you say into, into being suspect. All right. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you do. Uh, this was a hard one for me to record. I hope you watch it. Next week, my final on Bernard Purdy. I'm going to do a drum cover of Green Earrings, my favorite tune. All right. Leave your ideas or your thoughts on how this happened in the comments. See you on the next one, guys.